ஹலோ எவ்ரி ஒன் வெல்கம் டு எட் அனதர் லெக்சர் ஆஃப் கண்டபரி மலையாளம் லிட்ரேச்சர் இன் இங்கிலீஷ் ட்ரான்ஸ்லேஷன் டுடே ஐ ஷெல் டிஸ்கஸ் டூ நான் டீட்டெயில் டெக்ஸ் ஃபர்ஸ்ட் ஒன் ஜி சங்கரப்பிள்ளைஸ் ட்ராமா விங்ஸ் ஃப்ளாப்பிங் சம்வேர் ஆர் ஏதோ சிறகடி ஒச்சகள் அண்ட் த செகண்ட் ஒன் வாஸ் அ நாவல் ரிட்டன் பை தகிழ் சிவசங்கரப்பிள்ளை டைட்டில் செமீன் So let's discuss G. Shangarapillai's wings flapping somewhere or A. Do Charagudi Ochagal first. I'll give an introduction to G. Shangarapillai, then we'll move on to the summary and critical evaluation of the play. G. Shangarapillai was an Indian playwright, critic and director who became one of the most versatile and towering personalities of Indian literature and the theatre scene. His symbolist works were instrumental in defining modern Malayalam theatre. The Nadaka Kalari movement started by Shangarapillai in 1967 has created some of the best theatre practitioners in the country. He won the Kerala Sahitya Academy Award in 1964 for the work Rail Palangal. He also won the Sangeet Nadak Academy Award for theatre playwriting in 1979. G. Shangarapillai was born on 22nd June 1930 at Nalithattu Villa in Chirayankiri Thaluk of Thiruvandapuram district as a son of Ottavitil V. Gopalapillai and Muttakil Kamalakshi Amma. After completing his schooling from Kollam, Chirayankiri, Artingal and Thiruvandapuram, he passed BA Honours degree in Malayalam literature with the first rank in 1952. He worked as a lecturer in a college in Pathanandita for two years before joining Kerala Sahitya Academy for research in Kerala's folk music. He also worked in Madurai Gandhi Gram Institute, Lexicon Office and Devasam Board College, Shastam Gota. While holding the post of head of the department of Malayalam in DB College, Shastam Gota, he initiated the Nadaka Kalari movement in 1967 by organizing first of its kind. The professor was also instrumental in the setting up of school of drama at Trishur under the University of Calicut of which he was the founder director. He also held the post of the director at the School of Letters of Mahatma Gandhi University and was an executive member of National School of Drama. G. Shangarapillai's first work was a one-act play titled Sneha Dudan which was published in the year 1953. His other major works include விவாகம் சொர்க்கத்தில் நடக்குது பாரத வாக்கியம் கிராதம் திரும்பி வந்தான் தம்பி ரக்ஷா புருஷன் பந்தி சரசயனம் பொய் முகங்கள் கழுகன்மார் விலங்கும் வீணையம் பேய் பிடிச்சு லோகம் தர்மக்ஷேத்ரா குருக்ஷேத்ரா ஓலப்பாம்பு புஷ்ப கிரீடம் நிழல் குரு தட்சிணா நிதியும் நீதியும் மத்தளங்கள் ரயில் பாலங்கள் பொன்னும் குடம் சித்திரசலபங்கள் தாமர அண்ட் ஒரு கூட்டம் உறும்புகள் ஹி டைட் அண்ட் அன்டைம்லி டெத் ஆன் நியூ இயர்ஸ் ஈவ் இன் நைன்டீன் எயிட்டி நைன் அட் திஃப்டி நவ் லெட்ஸ் டிஸ்கஸ் த பிளே விங்ஸ் ஃபிளாப்பிங் சம்வேர் ஆர் ஏதோ சிறகடி ஒச்சகள் இட் ஷோ கேசஸ் குந்தி அஸ் த சென்ட்ரல் கேரக்டர் நரேட்டிங் த ஸ்டோரி ஆஃப் அவர் லைஃப் ஃப்ரம் அ ஃபீமேல் பர்ஸ்பெக்டிவ் வேர் த எபிசோட் வித் கர்ணா இஸ் இன்ட்ரோஸ்பெக்டட் வித் கம்பேஷன் குந்தி சேட்லி ரிஃப்ளெக்ட்ஸ் ஆன் த ஹிடன் பெயின்ஸ் ஆஃப் அ ஹெல்ப்லெஸ் மதர் அண்ட் டீட்டெயில்ஸ் அ கான்ஃப்ளெக்ஸ் தட் ட்ரோவ் ஹர் டு சர்டன் டிசிஷன்ஸ் இன் ஹர் லைஃப் த டைட்டில் ஆஃப் த பிளே இஸ் சிம்பாலிக் அஸ் இட் இண்டிகேட்ஸ் த க்ரூவல் ஃபேட் சஃபர்ட் பை கர்ணா த பிளே ஏதோ சிறகடி ஒச்சகள் வாஸ் ஒரிஜினலி டைட்டில் அக்னி ரதி Before summarizing the play Wings Flapping Somewhere I would like to give you the character study of both Kunti and Karna In Mahabharata Kunti was the daughter of Shura Sena a Yadava chief and the foster daughter of his cousin Kunti Bhoja Her birth name was Pritha Her father gave Kunti to his childless cousin Kunti Bhoja She was very beautiful and intelligent She is often regarded as one of the protagonists of the Mahabharata. Once Sage Durvasa visited Kunti Bhoja, being extremely pleased by all the comforts, patience and devotion offered by Kunti. He offered her a mantra that would invoke any god of her choice and he would bless her with children. Out of impetuous curiosity, Kunti invoked the god Surya or the sun god. Bound by the power of the mantra, Surya begot a child on her and restored her virginity. 
Pritha hid her pregnancy. Karna is born with characteristics of both pa- parents such as earrings and breastplate armor along with the glow of his father and the feet that look like his mother. The earrings and breastplate make him immortal like the gods, invincible before any god, human or demon. Pritha felt confused and ashamed, worried what everyone will think and how she will embarrass her family. So, she put the newborn baby in a padded basket, waterproofs and seals it with bee wax and set it adrift in the small river Ashwanadi by the palace. She later gets married to King Pandu of Hastinapur. Pandu, while hunting in a forest, mistakenly shot and killed Rishi Kindama and his wife as they had taken the form of a deer to mate. The dying sage placed a curse on Pandu since he had not only killed them in the midst of love making but was not remorseful for his actions. King Pandu argued with Sage Kindama by misquoting Sage Agastya's ruling on the right of Kshatriyas on hunting. Sage Kindama then decided to curse him to die if he ever should become intimate with his wife. Pandu renounced the kingdom and went into exile with Kundi and Madri. Pandu met some sages to advise him on how to attain heaven and salvation. They said without children he could never aspire to heaven. When Pandu expressed to Kundi his despair at the prospect of dying childless, he advises her to beget children by suitable illustrious men. Kundi used the boons given to her by Sage Durvasa to bear three sons, Yudhishthira by Yama, the god of death, Bhima by Vayu, the lord of the wind, and Arjuna by Indra, the king of the Swarga or heaven. Kunti, having warmed up to Madri during their exile, shares the mantra with her on the condition that she only use it once. Madri cleverly summons the Ashwins who give her twin sons, Nagula and Sahadeva. Coming to Karna, he is the son of Surya, the sun deity and princess Kunti. He was conceived and born to unmarried teenage Kunti who hides the pregnancy then out of shame abandons the newborn Karna in a basket on a river. The basket is discovered floating on the Ganges river and he is adopted and raised by foster Sudha parents named Radha and Adiradha Nandana, the charioteer of King Dhridharashtra. Karna grows up to be an accomplished warrior of extraordinary abilities, a gifted speaker and becomes a loyal friend of Duryodhana. He is appointed the king of Anga by Duryodhana. Karna joins the losing Duryodhana side of the Mahabharata war. He is the key antagonist who aims to kill Arjuna but dies in a battle with him during the Kurukshetra war. Moving on, we will now discuss the play Wings Flapping Somewhere or Edo Chiravudi Ochagal. The play begins with the description of stage arrangements. Three people, dressed accordingly to suit the requirements of the play, are standing in a raised platform away from the background scene. They are called Pari Parshvikar, who controls the curtains. In addition, they are talented in music and in dialogue delivery. They also have a flair for acting and their facial gestures help in delivering what this play intends to convey. They have half curtains in different colors and it is their duty to place the theatrical properties in the stage. So these three individuals are destined to perform activities on the stage. As they stand in a raised platform, the actors can easily appear on the stage from behind. In the forefront of the stage, a lamp is placed with the intention of invoking the god of fire. In the background, the accompanying actors are performing Chutatam a folk dance performed by holding torched coconut leaves in both hands. The actress is walking to the center stage while the performance is happening. The only lighting in the stage is the natural light from the torched leaves. The accompanying actors slowly leave from the stage. Silently praying and mentally accepting the character she has to play, the actress lights the lamp. When she lights the lamp, Mangalavadyam, the music that accompanies auspicious and holy ceremonies is heard from the background. Indicating the auspicious event, a yellow curtain with decorations is raised by the three people who control the curtains. The actress performs the religious rituals and prays for blessings for the successful ending of the play. 
in the midst of these happening there is also a recitation of rigveda hymns which the pari parshvika might be reciting the recitation goes like this i glorify agni the high priest of the sacrifice the divine the ministrant who presents the oblation to the gods and is the possessor of great wealth the actress comes to the center stage and in the background there is a sound of bells ringing in the temple and the sound of the conch shell the actress introduces herself as an actress who has been destined to act in numerous roles she has played the role of a woman who was cheated by her lover as a wife who was denied her rights as an oppressed woman in the patriarchal society and as a symbol of femininity who was gifted with size from other women and congratulations from men she wants to break away from the chains and boundaries that hold her inside but she is fearful of the conservative society that will destroy her she contemplates why a woman who is complete in herself can't be more strong willed she always hides away from her dreams passions and desires she selflessly conducts herself thinking everything to be a blessing without showing any protest she looks at the audience silently asking the question why can't she break away from these chains and boundaries in the background there are voices chanting she can she can she looks at the flaming fire in the lamp and requests for the strength to break away from the traditional notions of society the culture has restrained women to a certain role where she only knows how to shower affection and blessing that is why she hasn't yet become a vampire like monster the continuing recitation of hymns invoking the god of fire agni can be heard the actress says she sees everything she sees the disappointments of the present the nostalgia for the evergreen past and the sacrificed femininity a woman has dreamt of freedom from societal conventions that prevent her from pursuing her dreams but she always lived a selfless life seeing others happy and satisfied without raising her voice against the injustice and in the end she attains the fire not of her dreams or passions but the all destroying fire that consumes her the actress remembers her mother and how she also got consumed in the fire never attaining her aspirations the actress hears someone calling the name kunti in the middle of the ritualistic prayers the actress leaves the stage and appears as kunti the curtain is now blue in color and the background indicates that it is night when she appears in the stage there is a symphony of several musical instruments she looks at the sky and then at the very distant horizon kunti appears on the stage when she heard someone calling her name she heard that someone called her prita her birth name it was a familiar voice who called her name it was like chanting and then she heard the wings flapping that of a bird she tries to imitate the sound of that bird and fails it was a blended sound of weeping warning and helplessness and it was within prithana she is asking herself questions about the bird the bird who chanted prita whose wing flapping sound that is echoing in her mind she had come from inside her home when she heard the sound of the wings flapping but she is unable to find the source of that sound she fails before fate as she was late to find the origin of that sound that called her kunti remembers an auspicious event in the past when her son paid her respects after winning the kurukshetra war they were performing the ritualistic washing of their mother's feet her great sons yudhishthira who is known for his dharma bhima known for his strength and arjuna known for his virility are praising their mother for giving birth to them Kundi closes her eyes and blesses them. She lovingly touches their heads and then she hears the sound of someone weeping. It was Gandhari who lost all her children in the great war. Gandhari's face was dry as the earth and numb as the sky. Kundi couldn't bear the agony of another mother who sad over the demise of all her children. She went and hugged her. Kundi heard the same sound of the bird and the wings flapping. She contemplates on where the bird might have gone to. did it go to the inner forest beside the shores of ganges kunti realizes that she has heard the sound of wings flapping earlier she cannot describe the feeling when the bird chirps and she could never find the shadow of the bird kunti asks the bird about its identity 
declaring how its wings flapping sound has made her feel miserable every time she goes on to say that she has decided to see this bird and tries to remember when she had first acquainted its voice from the background of the stage resound the sounds of several musical instruments playing the curtain is now red in color and kundi is not old anymore she is presented as a young woman kundi reminiscences how she was rewarded a boon by durvasa who is known for his temper and unreasonable requests when durvasa visited kundi boja and sought his hospitality the king entrusted the sage to his daughter's care and tasked kundi with the responsibility of entertaining the sage and meeting all his needs during his stay with them she patiently puts up with all his requests and served the sage with great dedication before departing he rewarded kundi by teaching her the adarva veda mantras which enables a woman to invoke any god of her choice to beget children by them when kundi was a young woman she saw the world as a mirror of herself she thought all the natural phenomena happened for her the sun rising the setting of the sun the wind blowing the moonlight the streams flowing the flowers blooming all for her in that moment of passion she wanted to conquer this world curious and skeptical kundi decided to test the mantra she invoked surya the sun god the source of light heat and energy the shining light was both her desire and lust she desired fire that could paint magical worlds and could destroy everything with its strength she looked at the beautiful and glowing sun she closed her eyes and prayed to the power that lights the whole world kundi was not sad when she realized that she was carrying a child she was strong enough to face society when it will raise questions about the paternity of the child she had the strength to attract all the elements of nature within herself but when she thought about her father's face the curse of being a woman in society and the scourge that she would become for the past as well as the future generations she found herself drowning in her wrong doings it was then that she first heard the sound of wings flapping suddenly the scene shifts to the bank of a river it is night time the sad symphony of a musical instrument is accompanied by the fall of black curtains it is seen that kundi appears covering her head with a cloth and carrying a bundle in her hand fearing the fate of an unwed mother she had come to abandon the child she had heard the strange sounds of a bird and its wings flapping then too she was a mother numb about her destiny she wanted to throw away the baby to the river to drown her secrets it was not for herself but to keep the dignity of her family in front of the society when she tried to throw the child away the baby she was in cold she realized that she was not a cruel human being and her maternal instincts prevented her from performing that action it was a poor child born in the wrong womb a woman who pursued her passions and dreams she found the remains of a basket in the river bank she placed the newborn baby in a basket and set him afloat down a river the basket moved like a dream in the waves when she looked up the sky was crying and a star fell down she heard the wings flapping then too then kundi goes on to remember another episode when she had an encounter with adiratha a charioteer for the monarch of hastinapur he was a lucky man who was destined to raise the baby the queen had thrown away to keep her dignity in place the skarna was raised by his foster parents adiratha and his wife radha she never forgot what she had done even when she became a queen or when she nurtured her sons when adiratha met kundi he talked to her as if he knew the truth of karna's parentage he used harsh words by saying those who were abandoned will be saved by god those who will be thrown away by its mother will be nurtured by nature those words were arrows that struck straight into her heart kunti as if in revenge decided to conquer all powerful elements of nature when her husband pandu gave her permission to bear children through her boon she was doubtful whether to laugh or cry when pandu expressed to kundi his despair at the prospect of dying childless he advises her to beget children by suitable illustrious men but kundi used the boons given to her by sage durvasa to bear three sons kundi is surprised that pandu has given her permission no husband would ever give his wife to she felt dignified as it is done with her husband's consent but her thoughts move on to her first child when she had abandoned in the flowing waters of ganga karna made her a mother at first and he was her eldest son 
she prays that no mother suffer such agony in the future years the scene shifts again the people assigned with stage arrangements or pari parshvigar changes the background of the play so as to give an idea of a crowd assembled they play instruments and the curtain now is red in color the picture of two swords crossed appears at one end of the stage while kundi appears on the other end it was the weapon trial competition before the competition starts the contestants must announce their lineage so that men of equal ranks are placed together after arjuna announces his royal lineage it is time for karna to present his lineage kundi remembers how her first born son was insulted by her own children in front of all the people of hastinapur she reminisces how his face fell like a cloudy sky just like his father's kundi stayed silent and refused to voice any protest she was hurt and when she looked back she saw karna's father they both were silent witnesses to karna's insult if karna were to announce his chariot lineage it would disqualify him from competing against arjuna duryodhana steps in and announces karna as the king of angas Duryodhana sees in Karna a man who is an equal of Arjuna in martial abilities and someone to befriend to balance out Arjuna and therefore diminish the Pandavas. Kunti could never forget these events as these memories will never die. Kunti also witnessed how brothers fought each other on two sides in the Kurukshetra war. It was a terrible blow to Kunti when she realized that she hasn't got the courage to reveal the secrets she had placed in the dark corners of her mind. She became a strength for her five children and traveled many strange paths. She never gave herself an opportunity to fail. When it was time for them to cross swords at the battlefield, she cried out at fate for making her witness such a disastrous event. Kundi sadly remembers the battlefield after the war. It was days filled with darkness which she had refused to remember. She forgot about her eldest son and filled energy and strength in her other sons. When everything was over Kunti followed Gandhari to the battlefield where spirits of those who were killed in the great war might be roaming for attaining salvation In the mass of funeral pyres all she could see was shadows Kunti stands in her knees mourning for her eldest son who fell down in this battlefield His body lost all his glory and is lying there she is yearning to call Karna son my son Kundi kisses the ground where Karna lost his life and when she straightens up she witnesses a supernatural being wearing white wings and hands it has a masculine voice and it is rising high up in the sky it is evident that it is Karna's spirit that talks to Kundi the voice asks Kundi the reason for her appearance now he angrily questions whether she came to witness the failure of her first born or to boast about the success of other sons he accuses her of abandoning him who survived in nature's lap She had met Adharada before the commencement of the war to stop blood-bound brothers from fighting each other but fate intervened and now Karna died for dharma He informs Kundi that he is not distressed about abandoning him when he was an infant for being called the son of a charioteer or when his mother came to beg for the lives of his younger brothers He is glad that he has become eternal With a bloody body he will enter the star-studded heavenly path with the heart of a rising sun eternally living for upholding dharma expressing his deep emotions he kindly requests kundi whether he could call her mother just once he asks her not to torment herself in his thought he brings back harshness in his voice and asks kundi to leave the winged creature flies away flapping his hands kundi stands silent with tear filled eyes the curtain becomes red in color now kundi is emotionally torn and begins to utter something as if it is her last wish she wishes that the last rite should be performed for her first born along with the ancestors she is conflicted whether there will be people opposing to doing rites for karna to them she declares that karna was her first born and that they killed one of their own kundi hears the sound of a bird and its wings flapping when she declares the truth in front of the society she feared until now now the victorious has become defeated and saddened over the demise of one of their own kundi realizes that her life on earth is over and it is time to move on she hears the sound of the bird in the distant himalayan hills she follows dhritarashtra and gandhari to the himalayas she follows the sound of the bird that has always given her hope 
she hopes that it has the fire she has always craved in its neck she has accepted the boon of the womb from surya vayu indra and now she desires for the fire to consume her she leaves her home to lose the burden of her guilt kunti hears her son calling her back but she understands her destiny she requests her family relations and desires to keep a distance from her she now wants freedom from the chains that bound her she goes to meet her first lover who consumed her and to get destroyed in her arms she whispers an adieu to her sons who were her whole world she says goodbye to all her children and grandchildren she stops abruptly when she realizes that family linkages are so strong then she hears the sound of the wings flapping she sees a strange figure in the forest of the distant himalayas she doubtfully asks whether she is hearing the wing flapping sound of the god of the fire when she looks at a distance she sees two figures both guided by darkness leading way for one another she finds that her place is with them she broke the chains of her maternal bonds and tries to consummate her life in the fire in the forest the fire shines like a thirsty man consuming everything in its path after the kurukshetra war kundi moved to a forest near the himalayas with her brothers in law vidura and dhritarashtra and sister in law gandhari where all four of them later perished in a forest fire attaining heaven the play wings flapping somewhere is a symbolic play where the chirping sound of the bird and the wings flapping is indicative of karna and kundi's mental anguish over karna's fate it is a helpless torment of a mother who abandoned her first born and suffered the consequences when she concealed the truth at last she reveals to the whole world what she feared will result in losing her dignity she remembers the incidents that led her to the abandonment of karna and in each of these instances she heard the sound of wings flapping at the end of the play with all her duties done she leaves to the deep forest of the himalayas to be consumed by the fire that awakened her passions and desires next i shall discuss tagal shivashankar pillai's novel chemmi first i'll give an introduction to tagal shivashankar pillai then we'll move on to the summary and critical evaluation tagal shivashankar pillai is a popular malayalam novelist and short story writer who's widely known as tagal the name of his birthplace in alappuzha district As a writer he narrated the stories of the oppressed the poor lower caste members and the downtrodden in the society the critics often consider him as the kerala mopasan because of his skill as a short story writer and he is one of the most prominent figures who brought international recognition to malayalam literature tagadi has written 40 novels over 600 short stories and a few memoirs His novels and short stories address various concerns of the typical Kerala society in the mid 20th century. His novel Thotiyuda Magan published in 1947 is considered a pioneer work in Malayalam realistic novel. Tagadi's popular novels are Randidangadi, Tendi Vargam, Chemmin, Auseppinda Makkal, Eni Padigal, Anubhavangal Palichagal and Kayar. His short stories include the collection തെരഞ്ഞെടുത്ത കഥകൾ ഇൻകുലാബ് ഒരു കുട്ടനാടൻ കഥ നിത്യകന്യക വെള്ളപ്പൊക്കത്തിൽ ആൻഡ് സോ ഓൺ ദ നേഷൻ ഓണേർഡ് ഹിം വിത്ത് പത്മഭൂഷൺ ആൻഡ് ഹി വൺ ഇന്ത്യാസ് ഹയസ്റ്റ് ലിറ്ററി അവാർഡ് ദ ജ്ഞാനപീഠ് ഇൻ എയ്റ്റ് നയൻറ്റീൻ എയ്റ്റി ഫോർ ഫോർ ദ എപ്പിക് നോവൽ കയർ Tagadi's entire literary journey has been as a chronicler of the social struggles and sorrows of the lower classes in his native Kerala. Tagadi's fertile imagination is adept in weaving stories of the underdog who has been insulted, humiliated and abandoned and through his intimate grasp of social realities he makes a passionate plea for social change. Tagadi has always been hailed as the spokesperson of the working class and his novels portray the class struggle prevalent during his times. His days as an advocate provided him an opportunity to meet people belonging to the different strata of the society and he developed a genuine sympathy for them. Tagadi wrote in a simple lucid style about the common man and his concerns. His technique was uncomplicated with a mix of realism and romanticism. Now let's discuss Tagadi's most celebrated novel Chemmin which was published in the year 1965. 
It is an epic saga on the fishing community of Kerala. The novel is entirely different from the normal pattern of Thagari's works and it was an immediate success. It was translated into more than 50 languages all over the world and the Malayalam filmmaker Ramu Karyat adapted it as a film in 1965. Chemin, set in the background of the fisherman community, tells the story of the relationship between Karthama, the daughter of a Hindu fisherman named Chemin Kunya, and Parikuti, the son of a Muslim fish wholesaler. The theme of the novel revolves around a myth about chastity prevalent among the fisherman communities along the coastal Kerala state in the southern India. According to the myth, the life of a fisherman going for fishing in the sea depends on the chastity of his woman back in the hut. In case of any infidelity, people believe that the sea goddess or Kadalamma would consume him. On the other hand, if the woman or wife remains faithful or chaste, her man will return safe. Tagari won the Kendra Sahitya Academy Award for the novel in 1957. The novel was adapted to a film by Ramu Karyat in 1965. The film saw the conglomeration of the best in business for the first time in Malayalam. The novel was adapted into a screenplay by S.L. Puram Sadanandan and produced by Babu Ismail Said under the banner Kanmani Films. The film's cast includes Sheila as Karuthamma, Madhu as Parikuti, Kotarakar Sridhar Nair as Chemban Kunya and Satin as Palani. Marcus Bartley and U. Rajagopal were the cinematographers and editing was done by Rishikesh Mukherjee and K.D. George. The original score and songs were composed by Salil Chaudhary and the lyrics was done by Vailar Ramavarma. Chemin became the first South Indian film to win the Indian President's Gold Medal for the Best Film. It was screened at various international film festivals and won awards at the Cannes Film Festival and Chicago Film Festival. The novel was translated into many languages including English, Russian, German, Italian, Arabic and French along with several Indian languages. It had several English translations and the latest being the one by Anita Nair. The English translation of Chemin by Anita Nair was published in the year 2011. The novel is divided into two parts with 20 chapters. The novel begins with a conversation between Karthama and Parikuti near a boat on the shore. Karthama is the daughter of Chemban Kunya, a fisherman, and Parikuti is a young Muslim fish trader. Karthama says at the beginning of the novel that father of mine talks of buying a boat and nets, to which Parikuti answers that he does not have any money with him to help Chemban Kunya. Karthama then mocks him by calling Kochumudalali, while Parikuti calls her Valiyamarakati. They laugh a lot and they think about their childhood days. Karthama dreams while at home and her mother, Chucky, scolds her for being distracted. Panjami, Karthama's sister, tells Chucky about the conversation between Parikuti and Karthama. Chucky warns Karthama by saying, You are not a little girl anymore. You are a fisherwoman now. Chemban Kunya, Karthama's father, has only one dream in his life, that is to buy a boat and net. He befriends Parikuti and allows him to keep the baskets inside their house. Karthama finds her father whispering to Parikuti and she does not like the attitude of her father. She felt that Parikuti has been cheated by her parents. Parikuti became a regular visitor to their house. Chemban Kunya finally succeeds in buying a boat and net with the help of Parikuti on condition that the fish hold by the boat will be sold to him. Karthama feels exasperated with the whole thing and her mother Chucky reminds her daughter about the life of an Araya woman and the boundaries of strict social tradition. On the other hand, Chemban Kunya is greedy and he shies away from selling the fish to Parikuti. This leaves Parikuti penniless since he had given all the money to Chemban Kunya. Chemban Kunya gradually becomes immensely rich, especially after the season of Chagara, a boon for the local fisher folk. During that season, he meets a youngster named Palani, an orphan but a hard-working and efficient man. Chemban Kunya is impressed with Palani's skills and he invites him to his home. Chucky and Chemban Kunya devises a plan and Chucky asks Palani about his family and background. Chucky asks Palani whether he would like to marry Karthama and Palani gives his approval. Even though Chemban Kunya and Chucky knew about the love affair between Parikuti and Karthama, they didn't approve their marriage. Karthama tried to resist her family's decision but at last she had to agree to her family's wishes. Finally, Palani marries Karthama. 
Following the marriage, Karthama accompanies her husband to his village. Despite her mother's sudden illness and her father's repeated request to stay, in his fury, Champan Gunya disowns her. Far away from her home, both Palani and Karthama begin a new life. Parikute is utterly dejected but decides to stay at that place. On acquiring a boat and a net and subsequently adding one more, Champan Gunya becomes more greedy and heartless. With his dishonesty, he drives Parikute to bankruptcy. Meanwhile, Chakki dies. Champan Gunya does not wish to inform Karthama about Chakki's death. But Parikute feels that it is his responsibility to inform Karthama. So he decides to go to Palani's house. Karthama is shocked to hear about the news of her mother's death. Meanwhile, the people around Palani's house once again begin to spread gossips as they see Parikuti there. Karthama has now endeavoured to be a good wife and mother but Palani doubts her. Back home, Chemban Kunya marries Papi Kunya, the widow of the man from whom he had bought his first boat. Panjami finds it difficult to adjust with her stepmother and decides to leave her home. Chemban Kunya gets cheated by Papi Kunya as she takes the money from him to help her own son. Realizing that he has lost everything, Chemban Kunya turns insane. Panjami decides to go to the house of Karthama to stay along with her. The scandal about her old love for Perikuti spreads in the village and Palani's friends shun him and refuse to take him on their boats. Palani therefore decides to go alone into the sea at night for fishing. By a stroke of fate, Karthama and Parikuti meet that night and their old love is awakened. At that time, Palani is at the sea and baiting a large shark. He is caught in a huge whirlpool and is swallowed by the sea. Next morning, Karthama and Parikuti are also found dead, hand in hand, washed ashore. At a distance, the washed up corpses of Palani and the baited shark are also found. Thus, the story reasserts the myth of chastity among the Araya community. Chemin is a story of human relationship built around an archetype. Throughout the novel, there is a conflict between tradition and modernity. Transgression too emerges as a major concern in the novel. Karthama transgresses the norms of a society by falling in love with a Muslim man, Parikuti, which eventually leads to the scorn of villagers and death. The sea is presented as a major motive in the novel and it works both as a destructive and purifying force. Tagadi presents Karthama as a strong woman who tries to voice her opinions, though suppressed by the conservative society. Karthama is torn between the demands of the family and the customs of the community on one side and her instinctual and physical attraction towards Perikuti on the other. She can also be cited as a new woman as she takes a bold step at the end which is a proclamation of liberty. In this lecture, we discussed two non-detailed texts. First one, G. Shankara plays drama, Wings Flapping Somewhere and the second one, Tagari Shivashankara plays novel, Chemi. From wings flapping somewhere, you can expect questions like attempt a character sketch of Kundi, attempt a critical analysis of wings flapping somewhere, analyze the play from a female perspective, significance of the title wings flapping somewhere, the mythical significance of the play, comment on the ending of the play, characterization in wings flapping somewhere, the theatrical techniques employed by G. Shankara Pillai and also about the theme of the play. From Thakari's Chemmin, you can expect questions like attempt a critique of the novel, romantic elements employed in Chemmin, the representation of the Araya community and their traditional practices and superstitions, use of chastity myth in Chemmin, feminist thoughts in Chemmin, characterization in Chemmin, women characters in Chemmin, the different themes presented by Thakari in Chemmin, role and significance of tradition in Thakari's Chemmin, image of sea in Chemmin, Parikuti as a romantic character in Chemmin, and a discussion of the ending of the novel. Thank you.